There's a small village on the border of Wyoming and Idaho. It's located in the Teton Valley. And this is where we find the studio of representational artist Jason Bourbet. Hey, what's going on, man? How are you? Welcome. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Coming into Bourbet Studios and Gallery. Yeah. <laughs> Good to meet you. This is a nice space. Thanks, man. Jason Bourbet. Bourbet. <laughs> Bourbet. Bourbet. It's French. <laughs> Nene Monet Corbet Bourbet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bourbet, not Bourbet. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Guggenheim. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, the big series. Each is so different, you know? Personality of the year, 2019, very organized, everything was in its place. 2020, total shit show. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, I, so I did the pandemic in, uh, in the time it took me to watch the movie Manhattan, painted with my left hand and a palette knife. All right, so nationally acclaimed artist from New York to LA. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. And uh, it's nice to be connecting with you. Yeah. Um, I found you in Las Vegas during the NFT creation of Vegas Vicky. Correct. Yeah, and then so that, that that's pretty an interesting concept. You want to tell us a little bit about what's going on with Vegas Vicky? Yeah. So, um, look, I've been I've been a huge Vegas guy my whole life. I've got I, you know I went to Vegas on a road trip with my family when I was twelve, and I went on spring break with the guys in college, and um, you know I ran my only marathon there in two thousand five, and uh, you know when I went full time art in two thousand nine. I just, you know, my wife really loved Vegas, so she turned me back on to Vegas. So I started going every year for one to two weeks at a time and setting up my easel around Vegas and painting. And in the beginning, it was me and my boys, you know, staying at New York, New York, sharing one room, walking to the gas station, getting 30 racks of batteries, as we call them, cheap beers, and uh, lugging our stuff down, up and down the strip at 120 degrees. Uh, but over the years, I got, you know, more kind of connected in Vegas and Circa, which is the first ground up built casino in downtown Las Vegas since 1980, went up at the end of 2020. So in 2021, uh, our, let me see. Yeah. So in 2021 was the first time I saw it, fell in love with it. And then I saw Vegas Vicky, which was a neon sign that was saved off of Glitter Gulch by Jeff Victor, who's the vice president at Circa, former president of Fremont Street. And I just fell in love with it. And I told my collectors from Vegas, I said, if you ever run into anyone from Circa, tell them I'd love to do a painting of Vegas Vicky on location, and I'd love to do an NFT project. And um, sure enough, they ran into him, and you know, we started talking about the project. Um, so in uh, November of 2021, I went to Vegas with my family for Thanksgiving, met with Mr. Victor, toured Circa. We were like, all right, let's do this thing. And then in January, I went and painted Vegas Vicky eight days straight on location. And, um, and then later that year, later this year, earlier this year, I should say, in, uh, in June, we launched uh, the Vegas Vicky NFT project. So it, assuming that everybody knows what a blockchain is and how to like create an NFT. So, you know, like I, I like to give a lot of credit to Robert Rauschenberg, who's one of my favorite, you know, modern artists and, uh, you know, rest in peace, I think he passed in 2007. In the, uh, in the 60s, he had a famous uh, dust up with this guy, Bob Skull. So Bob and Ethel Skull, on a fleet of taxis, which back in the day, pre-Lyft and Uber, that's huge business in, in a major city, particularly in New York. And they had a great eye for collecting art. So they had collected, you know, Warhol, Basquiat, Keith Haring, uh, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, all these, all these paintings. Just that they had, they had the touch. So it turned out Bob and Ethel were getting divorced. So about a year after they bought a piece from Rauschenberg for $900 and another piece for $3,000, they both auctioned for, I want to say, about $30,000 a piece. And Rauschenberg famously went up to him and, you know, shoved him after the auction. And it was a big kerfuffle, a big to do. And, you know, he was pissed because he got paid so little and then they flipped it for so much in such a short period of time. So Rauschenberg went to California where all intellectual property law precedents are set and pitched what was essentially an analog blockchain wherein there would be a, 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 a finite record of the work created, the artists who created it, who they sold it to, what they sold it for, and lock in a resale percentage for artists. So it was way ahead of its time. People were like, no, absolutely not. And uh, you know, you do have artists that can stipulate that in their contracts today, such as Jeff Koons, who does on a, a very frequent basis. But for most up and coming artists, people are like, that's my risk, my reward. Anyway, you know, with the advent of blockchain technology, it's essentially we have this decentralized finance in 
various cryptocurrencies. So, you know, you have Bitcoin, then you have Ethereum, and you have Polygon, and you have everything all the way down the line. And what they do is they create a blockchain, which is essentially a commerce hub on, you know, within this technology. So there's an Ethereum blockchain, which is what we launched our project on. So what we did was we created uh, unique digital uh, properties that were sold as uh, different series and different tiers of NFTs based on my original painting of Vegas Vicky. And, uh, you know, with each tier, they cost a certain amount of money and they came with different benefits. So if you bought a dealer's choice, you would get, you know, a limo ride to, you know, from the airport to the casino and a comp cabana and three nights in a suite and $500 resort credit and all this really cool stuff. Yeah. And so people would buy it, they hold on to the NFT, and then when you redeem the NFT, you redeem these things. Uh, the property still sits on the blockchain, and for whatever else we decide to activate down the line, uh, they would be able to you know, transact that, sell it for either a gain or a loss, depending on what their tax strategy is. And, um, you know, and essentially someone else would get this NFT property. So it's just a, it's a digital record, and the, and the beautiful thing about the blockchain is it, it brings Rauschenberg's vision to life where you could stipulate a resale percentage from the original creator. So you, uh, the standard is 10%. You could go all the way up to as high as you want, you know. Um, but that's a beautiful thing. So, it, you know, in the future, I think real estate, I think taxes, I think a lot of things are going to be done on blockchain technology. Um, original art sales are going to be done on blockchain technology. So if you sell a painting for $10,000 and you own 10% and it transacts five years later for $100,000, you're going to get ten thousand back on that sale that you did ten years earlier. So it's brilliant. And so the original is in Circa. Yes. So the original is in the Legacy Club, uh, which is this beautiful club that they built at uh, on the penthouse floor of Circa. Overlooks all downtown Vegas. They have an indoor outdoor space. And Vegas Vicky, when you come up or on the elevators, you make a left uh, past the Hostess. The original painting is on the wall, and it's uh, directly across from two million dollars of gold brick. So it's very nice correlation. It's very close. Cool. It's a long, uh, long way from standing on the street in New York and painting the Guggenheim. You got that right. <laughs> I've always embraced innovation, and I think it's important to experiment and to continue to grow, both stylistically and in the way you approach your business. So it was something I didn't want to miss out, and it was something that you know I did with a couple, a couple of partners that are great guys. This guy Connor, I went to college with. My friend Pierce from Vegas. You know, it's just it's been a great learning experience, and. The way that you know the IRS is focused on you know transactions you know through Venmo and these third-party uh, payment platforms over six hundred dollars. I think there's a lot of scrutiny coming. Um, I think what you see now is not what you're going to see in a year or in five years, but the potential is there, the growth is there, and I think if you tether yourself to the right horse in this race, kind of just like you know people did in the original dot-com boom, uh, you could make a fortune. You could lose a fortune, but you know as with anything else, don't go whole hog into one direction. It, um, it, it's nice that you resolved the issue of like turning an original piece into an NFT because I think that that has, uh, you know, when we went to Art Basel last year in 2021, um, there was a division in between like the original artists and the NFT artists. Right. So I mentioned the Guggenheim. Yes. So I was living in Manhattan for many years and uh, I was working as a business director of an ad agency and my then girlfriend, now wife Erin convinced me that it was time for me to take the lead and become a full-time artist. So I did that when I was 28 years old. And uh, my, I, my first day of being a full-time artist is July 2nd of 2009, which is my Independence Day. So I found myself not knowing what to do, so I decided I was going to set up my easel and paint around Manhattan. Obviously, I'm not a shy guy, so it's just an opportunity for me to meet collectors and put myself out there. So um, I've always loved Frank Lloyd Wright. I've always loved the Guggenheim. I think it's one of the most astonishing buildings in the world. So. I set up my easel on Fifth Avenue across the street, and I was doing my painting uh, in July of 2009, which was my first professional painting. Um, I had this couple from Milan, and their daughter walked by, and they're like, oh, we really like it. And, you know, this was a Tuesday. They're like, when are you going to finish it? I'm like, Thursday. They're like, great, do you have a card? I didn't. So I wrote my email on palette paper and ripped it off, and they're like, well, give me your number. And I'm like, all right. Didn't think anything of it. And, um, and I get a call from this family, and they want to see the painting in 20 minutes. So I run down to my apartment on 93rd, get everything ready. They end up coming in. They love it. They bought that. They bought a painting that I did of the Miracle on Hudson Crash. And um, I threw in shipping like an idiot. I had no idea what I was doing at the time. Oh, yeah. And uh, so anyway, short story long, sell, the, sell my first Guggenheim pretty much off the easel. Turned out, postscript, that it was more expensive 
to ship those paintings than it was for me to fly to Milan and hand deliver them, which I did. Yeah. And then I spent a week there driving around Brera painting, which was amazing. And um, so the next year I wanted to paint the Guggenheim again, but so I decided I was going to make a commitment to do a Guggenheim every year for 20 years. So they're, the constants are, it's the same general composition, they're all 30 by 30s, they're all done around the same period of time, which is like mid to late summer, and the only thing that changes is style. So I figured I could use it as a litmus test of my stylistic evolution, um, and also just the commitment to myself that in 20 years I'd still be painting. So uh, it's 2022, I just finished year 14, uh, so I have six years to go, and uh, last summer I had a vice president from the Guggenheim Foundation came to my studio when it was in my home in, in the Springs, and you know she was really excited about the series, so long-term goal, all 20 in the Guggenheim. Oh, you gotta get the one back from Milan. That is a whole different story, uh, but I can't go into it in an interview. <laughs> I'll have to tell you some other time. <laughs> so you're in a retrospective period. Yes, but yeah, all 20 in the Guggenheim would be super dope, so we'll see what happens. The, um, yeah, your, your style does change a little bit, so you, you, you're, Represent, representational mm -hmm. is what you would say representational it's kind of like impressionist uh, representational like it's my impression of realism and you know I take a lot of liberties and I create kind of the construct that makes sense in my mind like you know it's like how I see things and I try to communicate that I'm partially colorblind mm -hmm. so I have a hard time with grays greens and uh, purples for whatever reason um, which is why you see a lot of blue, red, and yellow in my paintings, because those are colors that I have no problem discerning. <laughs> no, and, and it's so funny because I'm this guy who could, like, you know, I see the world in my own unique lens, and I'm an artist, and I always thought something was wrong with me, and I just didn't know that I was partially colorblind. <laughs> but so what I was thinking is that your style does change. Like, if you look at your stuff, you've got representational, and then but you had sort of this collage, mm -hmm. uh, period and then it disappears and it comes back. Yes. You know, I think one of the things that, you know, so I've been self-represented since I went full-time in 2009. Never had a gallerist, never had an art rep. And, you know, part of the reason is uh, I just, I wanted to be uh, creatively free. I also felt very confident in building my own market and building my brand and, and building that entire pricing strategy and structure over the years. So I wanted to do it my way, essentially. And one of the things that happens with a gallery is You'll do this painting and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I really love that painting of Radio City. Make 10 of them for me, you know? And all of a sudden, you are you find yourself in a situation where you need to go and get a, a group of people helping you co-create your work, you know, which is from Rembrandt to Warhol, very standard protocol. And, um, and then you have shows in three different cities and that's all well and good, but, you know, you start to become a factory. And, you know, I always want the leeway to, and the latitude to move from one style to another, or one subject to another. Like, I didn't want to come here and just start painting, like, you know, bull moose and, you know, eagles and what have you. Like, you know, and I have dabbled in wildlife, but it's kind of like there's enough of that out here and it's done well, so it doesn't need to be redone. I'm not going to change who I am, which is a, you know, a city guy living in a small town and there's always influence in neon in Manhattan. And I'm, you know, I don't intend to change that. And I believe that every time I create a neon and a plain air painting and a collage painting portrait, each one of those get better respectively because I learned something in each single work. Well, the, um, you, you did do one painting when you fir first showed up. That It's two guys look overlooking the Teton Valley portion of the Tetons. Yes. And I like that it's gray. It's yes. Like, it, there's, no, there's no collage in it. There's no wording. Right. Um, it, it's completely different. But, and so you even changed the color scheme of that one. Right. And, you know, there's something very timeless about a monochromatic painting. You know, you look at a, a lot of the sepia tone photos that you'd see from the old time photos, like when you go and dress up with your family and, um, you know, and uh, with black and white, I've always been a fan and I focus on uh, using specifically Mars black and titanium white because you get a kind of rich silver look to it. And I've tried the entire spectrum of whites and blacks. And once I find like something that I like, I ride it out for as long as I can learn everything I can, and then switch to something else. I had a question about those newspaper collage pieces that you do. Mm -hmm. um, are you painting those words? I, I have, I've never been close enough to one of them to see you. Like, I mean, I'm sorry to report, I just had a four by five foot collage uh, portrait of Dr. J in here that I just delivered to Vegas. But um, So what I do is, 
their actual, when I started that series, it was actual New York Post uh, headlines. So I would like cut them out of papers and paste them on. Um, as the style evolved, you know, especially with commissions, I curate the content within each portrait. So I create the headlines, but it is actually physically collaged on and then the image is built out of the letters. So there's usually the, it's kind of like images in the body and headlines in the face. And the idea is just kind of the sum of the parts. So, you know, if I was doing like an anthropological study of a person and was able to write a book, book report about them, I'm trying to condense that into one picture. So when you step back, you see the image and you know who it is. And then when you get up close, you see what makes them tick, what's important to them, who's important to them. And, you know, I like to think of it as not that I project any kind of apocalyptic scenario, though I do love zombie movies and shows. It's like if someone found this as an isolated piece of humanity, they'd learn so much about not only the person, but the people and the context of the time in which it was created because they would have a date on it. And it's just some, you know, something that I think is just kind of a cool keepsake to have and something that you know, I hope when I create, people want to keep in their family and pass down from generation to generation. The uh, one that is really representational of that concept of, of the, the historical is the, the commission piece that you did for the pop -ups. Yes. So, because it, I didn't see it at first, and I was like, oh, where he didn't do any of the collage. Right. And then you look into it, and it's like all of their family photos. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Matt and Julie were amazing to work with. They're, they were working on renovating this beautiful, like, kind of, like, old, like, barn house. It's just a really amazing place. And uh, so we decided on American Gothic, but we wanted to personalize it. So in their shirts and in his overalls, that's where I put the collage on. And so when you look back, it just looks like a pattern, but then you get in close and really kind of experience it. And so uh, I was, that was a really fun painting to do. Yeah. This plain air painting that you're doing where you're participating in these outside paintings, I'm surprised because mm -hmm. I, I see you paint with acrylic. Yes. And so... Do you find it difficult to paint outside with acrylic because it dries so fast? Oh, that's why I love it. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I've never been a, an oil guy, mostly because I'm allergic to all the different, you know, turpentine and linseed and all these different oil kind of mediums. So I've been an acrylic guy for years, but I love acrylic because it dries quickly because I paint in layers. So for me, it's amazing when I'm out doing something quickly and I'm like, all right, you learn when you're doing like quick draw, you're like, okay, I gotta have six palettes mixed. So I'm gonna work on the sky now, and then I'm going to work on the lower portion of the canvas next. Then I'm going to work on the middle portion of the canvas next. Then I'm going to go back to the sky. Then I'm going to come down to the lower portion. Because otherwise you start putting paint all over the wrong place. And you put your hand down and it gets it turns into a mess. So I've always avoided painting outside because um, it dries so fast. Because I use very small little dabs. Right. But you're mixing your paint in like larger portions at once. Yes. So there's this thing called a Masterson Stay Wet Palette like 10 bucks, they're a plastic palette and they have a sponge inside and then you have this porous paper. So you soak the paper for 30 minutes in hot water. Then what I like to do, pro tip, you put a clean sheet, then the sponge, which is soaked with cold water, but not drenched. And then you put this porous sheet over and then you have a top. So you create uh, a color and you can keep it active for two to three days. And so that's a huge blessing because that's one of the benefits of oil. You know, you put it on your palette and you could have the same tone going for a week. And so um, that's been a huge game changer. So if you're into acrylics and you're outside, Master Sin Stay Wet Palette. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, send this to them for some sponsorship. That's right. Master Sin. <laughs> Hi, Master Sin. <laughs> so you said pro tip. Are you professionally trained or did you teach yourself? Or? I, was, I was extremely blessed that my mom was an art school dropout who became a nurse. And so she got a paintbrush in my hand when I was two years old. And so I was drawing and painting all through my childhood. And um, the biggest blessing for me was in ninth grade, when I was, you know, 13 years old, I, we had a ninth grade center in a 10 to 12 building. So we had, you know, about 500 people in our graduating class. So it was a pretty big class on Long Island. Um, the art class in ninth grade center was filled up. So I walked over to the 10 12 building, just walked into the first art class I saw, and it happened to be advanced placement art. And so a woman named uh, Miss Hines, who then became Mrs. Livesey, was teaching the class. She goes, excuse me, what are you doing? And of course, I'm like 4'11 and 90 pounds, and all the other people are like, who is this pipsqueak, you know? I don't know how I did it, but I talked myself into the AP art class. So I was taking advanced placement art from ninth grade all the way through 12th grade. Um, our teacher would bring in this, uh, this guy, the late great Jeff Fisher, who would do figure drawing with us every Friday. 
Um, and our teacher was extremely incredible. She taught us that art could be a career. She brought in people from Carnegie Mellon and Pratt and RISD to talk to us, people giving us ideas on how to build up scholarships so you could go to art school, how you could make a career out of it. Um, we were obligated to go through two sketchbooks a year. And we had peer reviews and we would review our figure drawings and you know, I've had my work torn up in front of the class and you know, I developed a very thick skin and you know, I got into a couple of great art schools basically on my sketchbook alone, but I wanted to run at a D1 level when I was a much slimmer man, so I took a full scholarship to Boston University, ended up with a Bachelor of Fine Arts and Graphic Design with concentrations in advertising art history. Uh, but we had two years foundation, drawing, painting, sculpture, printmaking, photography, so you know, I'm classically trained in, uh, classically trained in all the different modalities of art. And um, I always gravitated toward painting, and um, that was my love, and that's what I decided to pursue. The process of it, the tactile nature of it, the, the planning, the result, the colors you're able to get, the experience of, of a painting is something I love. And um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I love the business of art. I love the mechanisms behind everything. You know, the creating, yes, absolutely, but, you know, the how are you putting the art in the world, what part of the process are you sharing, the pricing, and connecting with a collector and selling the work and, you know, sending appraisal letters and staying in touch with all your collectors. I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. And really, you know, if anyone wants to go into being an artist, I tell them, like, here's what I would do. Get a business degree in two years if you can. Get out, create the whole time, and just go straight into art business. Yeah. It's, a, you know, going to art school and, like, no friends, Pratt and RISD and Carnegie Mellon, like, it's all, all great institutions, but none of these schools focus enough on the aspects of business. You come out as an artist and try to be an artist, you're going to have to know how to do a freelancer contract. You're going to have to know how to retain a certain amount of money you're paid. You're going to have to learn how to collect taxes. You're going to have to learn how to pay taxes. You're going to have to learn to build a brand. You're going to have to learn social media and marketing. And you're going to have to learn not how to fall into off a cliff on Twitter with one tweet and destroy your entire brand. Um, you know, so really what people need to be learning is business and marketing. And, you know, if you're an artist, you're an artist, you're always going to be an artist. You'll create at 3 in the morning while you're crying before a final exam. But get out of school as fast as you can, or better yet, go work for someone. Be an apprentice. You know, it's, do you really need to saddle yourself with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt? Like, I was very fortunate. Athletics paid for my whole school. Uh, you know, I don't think I would have went to a four-year school if I didn't get a full ride. But, you know, I'm just, I, I just want to paint till I'm dead. I'm never going to retire. You know, I want to be like uh, Matisse, who's on his deathbed with a long stick and an implement creating on the wall, you know, <laughs> on his oh. way out. <laughs> I think that camera might have cut out. Oh, and this one too? Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come and uh, interview me and uh, talk about art. And thank you to everyone who took a moment to watch this video. And if you're in the Victor or Jackson Hole area, come on down to Bay Studios and Gallery at 10 South Main Street, suite number 203. Would love to show you around, have a cup of coffee, have a cocktail, and talk art. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Subscribe to this channel and hit the like button. Comment below. We love to hear what you think.